Good morning and welcome to ATARC's Law Enforcement Summit, Securing Your Environment with Automation. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Alyssa Cole and I'm the Events Manager here over at ATARC. ATARC stands for the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. ATARC is a nonprofit that facilitates collaboration between government, industry, and academia in order to accelerate technology modernization initiatives. We provide ongoing opportunities for cross-agency collaboration through on-site interaction, learning, and market research. Thank you to our partners over at Red Hat and Carousel for helping us to create today's summit. You're truly both great partners to us here at ATARC. Additionally, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Today will be an informative event full of discussion around security automation, enabling zero trust security, the, the challenges around implementing them, and so much more. We hope you enjoy this great and informative day. We'd also like to remind you that after each panel, there will be a time for Q&A. Please place all questions that you have in the Q&A box on your screen. During the panels, we'll ask our amazing speakers the questions that you provide. I'll also remind you that you should answer all poll questions throughout the today's panels if you would like to be eligible for CBE credits. Up first, I'd like to introduce our visionary keynote, William Kirkendale. Bill is the Chief Information Officer in, in, within the Information Technology Office of the Director, Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency for the District of Columbia. Bill, please take it away. Oh, there you go. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you for attending. I, uh, I, I know I'm the visionary keynote speaker here. I'm not sure any of this is going to be quite visionary. And by the way, I have to mention that I have a last minute call in uh, as of Friday, <laughs> replacing the CIO of the uh, FBI, I believe. Um, and of course, nobody's ever heard of, well, maybe some of you all, and hopefully uh, for all the right reasons, but uh, court services and offender supervision. So we call ourselves CSOSA. We are a federal agency and uh, we perform the uh, responsibility for parole, probation, and pretrial probation. We have an ent independent entity within our organization that does pretrial probation. So we've got about, we're a federal agency with a local mission, which is kind of unusual. Um, although we're a small agency, we're not an insignificant, uh, um, insignificant in terms of size. We've got 12, about 12 physical sites in the city, about a thousand, employees, uh, maybe a little bit more in the user uh, community, uh, up to 1,200, I think, depending on the day and uh, the number of contractors that we have on board. Um, we supervise about uh, 8,000 offenders on any given day uh, in the District of Columbia, have a couple thousand folks on uh, defendants on pretrial probation awaiting uh, trial or court, their court date. And so we um, make sure that they're compliant. We, uh, these folks range from, you know, DUIs to uh, you know sex offenders uh, and 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 even murderers. Um, there are uh, various levels of risk that we assign to them, and then a corresponding uh, uh, level of uh, uh, monitoring and compliance that they're responsible for. And then we also try to rehabilitate them, so to speak. Uh, we have many programs to um, try to integrate uh, these folks back into the community and to. Uh, uh, such as uh, drug treatment programs um, for the sex offenders. We have, you know, psychological services, uh, mental health services, um, domestic violence cases. Uh, you've all probably seen the movie Anger Management, so anger management classes and things like that. And then we coordinate with the rest of the D.C. law enforcement and criminal justice community and um, uh, the courts, the police department, uh, and the any number of, I think, 30-some-odd law enforcement agencies in the district. So we've got quite uh, quite a responsibility in D.C. Um, Sixty some odd percent of folks who have committed who commit a crime have done it before, so they've likely been in our system before. Um, so we have a lot of good data, and um, we were uh, created as a result of the uh, Revitalization uh, Act in the '90s, and um, where they brought probation, parole, and pretrial together that were actually district uh, functions. So you can think of it as, uh, well, in a state like Virginia, you know, the corrections comes out of the state uh, government and um, uh, 
the uh, probation is usually out of the courts, uh, the circuit courts, I think. So um, the district is a little unusual. It's not, uh, it's a city, I suppose, or it's a district. That's what it is, right? I've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, prior to uh, being the CIO here at CISOSA, I was uh, practicing in IT security, uh, consulting to federal government agencies. And as a matter of fact, it's kind of interesting. I feel like we've uh, almost uh, renewed these days with this zero trust uh, requirements. And, and it also is very analogous to the time I remember in 2002 when uh, 853, the first draft of 853 came out. And I was like, oh, Eureka, finally, they've organized uh, this stuff because you know we were all over the place. It was very overwhelming. Um, firewalls were you know set to... Uh, allow all and uh, passwords were your name and things like that. And then of course, um, there was all these types of tools and devices and technologies that were coming around. And, and again, it was overwhelming. There wasn't any real organization or structure. I think there was a, a risk uh, or 837 in the, uh, the approach to assessing and doing certification and accreditation. But once the catalog came out, it provided a real organized way of going through all of, you know, I mean, one thing wasn't more important than the other. Um, so. I feel like it's similar. We're in a similar situation here. Um, I don't think the guidance is quite there yet, that it's quite organized. It's a little overwhelming. They have the pillars for zero trust. And there's, um, and I wanted to say too, by the way, that uh, automation is implicit, I think, in zero trust. So there's a lot of confluence between these two topics that we have here today in the couple of panels that are going to follow me. The, um, uh, you know, we were, as IT security practitioners or IT architects or IT leaders or practitioners where, you know, we automate, that's what we do. It's kind of like Descartes, uh, I think, therefore I am, I think, therefore I automate. That's what pretty much what we're in the business to do. So uh, it's a good uh, frame of reference uh, to, you know, when, you, when you're looking at all of this, uh, all these requirements that we have through the mandates and, and our attempts to uh, take our, our business functions uh, out to the cloud and to access them over the internet rather than coming in through the network and, and, and going back out. Um, I also think that back in the day, it was you know, doing the CNA and the uh, implementing the 853 controls and 853A, doing the assessments and, and so forth, that it, it seemed to me at the time, in fact, with my colleagues as well, we kind of joked about it, it was kind of a sneaky little way to institute uh, operational pro processes that were necessary already. Um, and that we're good. So today, I think we, we've got a little bit of a different uh, angle, I think, but it's a little even more exciting, I think, in that we want to we want to open up, especially given the last couple of years and uh, the new nature of work with remote access. And for a lot of your organizations who have branch offices and everything, uh, coming in through the VPN and heading back out is just inefficient, right? And so. Um, the ability to you know get after these assets and maybe perhaps be at home and have your internet connection go down and um, then jump over to Starbucks and just to get another internet connection and get out to your applications uh, without having to go through the VPN that okay it was is another uh, scenario where if that goes down doesn't matter where you come from Starbucks or at home you know you're SOL so I think that um, the idea to to bring our applications to our users in a more, you know, in a, in a more efficient, effective, and, and easy way. And that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be barriers. And in fact, automation is um, implicitly about not just automating and bringing all these different aspects of zero trust or all of your security together. Um, and uh, it's it's about um, it's about um, bringing the um, uh, bring in the 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 uh, requirements uh, into 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 focus, and you know we've got lots of tools and technologies out there that are disparate. Lots of things that we're already doing that can fit into zero trust, but it's it's not as easy as um, you know just buying one tool. And there are tools that are that are, that'll say that they do everything. Uh, they're very good at a few things, but then there are other things that are not so good. So we're gonna to have to connect these things. And we've got all of those pillars, all those different things. We've got the users, we've got the data, we've got these applications, workloads, and um, there's a lot of work to do and a lot of things that we need to bring together to give us a, you know, a, a good rounded picture of um, what's going on in our network. And that's the key, what's going on. First of all, we're, we're not gonna allow folks in um, unless we know who they are, right? Um, 
it's similar to the things that we're seeing in our personal lives with Apple or with uh, Facebook or banks, where we have, um, you know, uh, I, I think it's one of them that says, is, is somebody just tried to log in from Baltimore. Was that you? And I'm not in Baltimore, but I, there's a pattern with that particular application. I know that it always thinks I'm in Baltimore. I guess it's my IP address here. In any case, um, so, you know, challenge questions or whatever it is that, that make sure uh, that, that we are who we say that we are and tying things to our devices, which I think will be a best practice in our government issued uh, equipment. Um, you know, when we go <laughs> use a credit card, I've never been to New Orleans. And I think when I do go, I'll probably end up in some CD bar in, in, in some back alley because I like CD bars. And if and of course Chase doesn't has never seen me in New Orleans and and I don't normally go to CD bars, um, but I although you know every once in a while and I probably haven't used the Chase credit card, but I try to pay for my drinks there and what happens it gets declined, and uh, all of a sudden you know I get a dirty look from this pretty rugged bouncer or bouncer and bartender, and I said listen is there an ATM around here <laughs> so. I wrote in the ATM and he makes me leave my girlfriend behind until I come back. Uh, you know, I think that there's, you know, possibilities of even having uh, challenge questions at a point of sale. Um, and that may be something that we see down the road. Um, but that's the type of thing that we're, we're talking about. The um, constant verification of who we are, where we're coming from. And that's just implicitly automation, right? Um, bringing together those events and information, and it's gonna be challenging. We've got a lot of data sources and a lot of things going on, a lot of uh, network devices and applications and um, bringing all this information in. And we, some of us have, you know, already we have our dashboards and we have our CDM requirements and we have um, whatever else we're doing that um, is, is um, uh, something's gonna to have to merge with these zero trust principles and the requirements that we have. And again, I think that there is still some room to be desired in the uh, guidance area, um, helping us along. Um, a couple of things came to mind. One of the most exciting parts of this, I think, is that we have to light up at least one application or mission critical, I think it was mission critical application uh, over the internet and that goes hand in hand with all of the security requirements that we have. And of course, you know, that's a good thing. I think that's going to, you know, really drive, drive us to, to dig deep and to understand all of these zero trust requirements and how we can do that so that we can we can actually so it, you know have a real practical application uh, of, of the uh, zero trust requirements. Um, a couple other things I thought of. Let's see. Um, the uh, I have some notes here. Let's see. The uh, you know there's a a bunch of, I want to, you know, there's a bunch of questionnaires out there. One of them I saw on the Microsoft site. Um, some of the uh, consultants that we're hiring are coming in trying to give us an assessment and do things, you know, give, you know, kind of take a look at the landscape. Uh, it's a, very important to take inventory of our, obviously our assets, our data sources, um, all the points of um, uh, contention. And it's going to be, you know, to just sort of do a big broad broad sweep of all of that is is tricky. I think the key is to go after one application, one. Uh, I think just you know for purposes of for our purposes, we are using Office three sixty five, so we're going to focus on that. Um, our next application in the priority list will be our cloud application, our core case management application. So um, there's. Um, a, definitely a, uh, a, a the potential to be overwhelmed by these requirements and automation. I mean, just 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 thinking about all the different things that you you know you need to automate. There's um, probably um, I, I would guess most most agencies most practitioners are in the same boat as me. These mandates and these requirements are new. Um, it's going to be a journey, and uh, we're just starting it right now. So. Uh, Get ready for the ride. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Bill. That was a great keynote. Um, up next, we're going to have our first panel of the day. For this panel, we're going to be having Jason Miller moderate. So Jason, if you want to turn on your camera, 
um, I'll turn it over to you. All right, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, Bill, I love that. I think therefore I automate. Uh, I will probably steal that and use that in a headline someday. So when I do, you should know that that is a credit that you will absolutely deserve, though. I probably will not be able to give it to you in a headline because that's kind of weird to say <laughs> right. Bill from this says this, but uh, th I think therefore I automate. Uh, uh, I will steal that. I, will, I was just trying kind of, to find that. I was trying to figure out how to say it in Latin, but <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that would have lost me there. So yeah. uh, um, don't worry. But I uh, appreciate it. I think I think there's a lot to talk about here. So Eric Sanders, Sebastian Dunn, come on, join me on on the on the um, on the camera. And uh, Bill, we will catch up with you in the next segment. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to all my folks at uh, HR, Hannah Folick, Tom Suter, Alyssa, of course for inviting me to moderate. Of course, I always love these events. As you heard, uh, I'm Jason Miller, executive editor of Federal News Network. You can find us, of course, on 1500 AM on your AM dial. Yes, yes, go to your car, sit there and just listen to AM radio because that, that the button still works in your car. And of course, if you don't wanna just sit in your car and listen to the radio, you can always find us on federalnewsnetwork.com. Now, I usually like to start my, when I moderate a panel with some facts and figures. It's still a little early if you haven't had your coffee yet or if it hasn't kicked in, I like to get your mind thinking. So let's get started on some facts and figures. I'm gonna tell you something you probably know, $10.4 billion. Yes, you probably recognize that number. That's the 2023 cybersecurity budget request from the White House that just came out last week. And as you probably also know, that's $1.1 billion above the 2022 request. Now, here's something maybe you don't know. I'm going back to 2020 here, but a survey of public sector respondents found that 32% of the more than 1,000 respondents already use automation tools. 67% say automation tools is reducing stress on their security personnel. And 70% say it helps the security folks uh, really focus on critical vulnerabilities. So the reason why I'm combining these two things is where money is gonna be spent next year. Well, it sounds like automation tools has a lot of promise and a lot of already uh, people who buy into it. So there's one kind of a path, a trend that maybe you'll see. Second figure, 32%. Let me think about that number for a second. That is the percentage of robotics process automation programs that have incorporated intelligence automation features like machine learning, artificial intelligence, image recognition, chat box, natural language processing. Now, why is that important to our discussion? Well, RPA is being used much more, but when these RPAs get more advanced, you can apply them to security challenges and you can apply them to things like DevSecOps. All right, last one, 613. Now this is a brand new number just figured out this morning. That is the number of known vulner exploited vulnerabilities in the CISA exploited vulnerabilities catalog. That includes 42 new ones added since, since March 28th. That number is growing. I think I did something, I looked at it maybe a month and a half ago, and it was only 460 odd uh, known vulnerabilities. So automation is needed to keep up with this ever growing number of challenges and threats. All right, give you a couple food for thought. Give listen, as you listen to the panel say, also gives you something to talk about at dinner tonight. You could pick up one of those and have a great conversation with your family and friends and really uh, get them into uh, security. Now for our panelists today, what I've asked them to do is take about three to five minutes to tell you something you don't know about their efforts to take advantage of automation to improve business processes, mission outcomes, and of course, cybersecurity. And then we will get to audience questions. Please participate. Remember, I'm a reporter. I can ask questions all day. That is my job. So we want you to take part. A couple of tidbits here uh, that I'm just gonna start with about the security automation and why we're talking about it and why it's so popular. When you go back to the Zero Trust memo, the final strategy that the uh, Office Management and Budget put out earlier this year in January, one of the things about automation that comes up, and if you do a search, it comes up actually seven times. So I did that search this morning, but there's a whole section on automating security responses. And in fact, what OMB calls this is a practical necessity to deal with your automation uh, or, or source, security orchestration, automation and response. They talk about you know uh, things like careful tuning, iteration, sensitivities, the business needs, all these pieces and parts that go into it. And of course, the data, you gotta have Good data, rich data, and data that uh, can be protected. So uh, with that little bit of context for our discussion, let me turn to Eric, uh, Eric Sanders from uh, DHS. Eric, I'm gonna let you uh, start us off and, and tell us something we don't know. Good morning, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, DHS and our Office of Intelligence and Analysis first. Um, I'm relatively new here, so I'm, I'm learning along with you sometimes, but uh, 
Uh, DHS has got about 14 components and we're one of nine components that have an intelligence mission. Uh, we're the only uh, component that, that is their sole mission uh, is intelligence. So we represent DHS uh, to the intelligence community. Uh, we also help DHS or represent DHS to the state, local, uh, tribal, and territorial leaders uh, and organizations. And we're the only intelligence component of the uh, of the IC who is charged with actually um, providing intelligence to that state, local, uh, tribal and territorial uh, organizations and governments. Um, so, I, you know, that, to me, that's pretty fascinating. We kind of straddle that fence, if you will, between, um, you know, a domestic mission and, and a, you know, a foreign intelligence mission. Uh, the uh, I can go on and on about INA. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff about it, but you know, kind of keeping with the theme here, um, we're very much involved in automation. We're very much in, involved in uh, supporting others, like the CBP perform their mission. Uh, to that, um, to that end, we helped create this uh, national vetting center. Uh, where we're able to automate the vetting of persons coming in at our borders. And um, it's it's done a lot, I think, to help, you know, keep the United States protected against, you know, potentially, you know, bad folks trying to get in. Um, you know, this is the folks trying to get in, at, you know, legitimate border crossings and things like that. Um, and we also helped uh, well, with the Afghan crisis. We helped vet, you know, the folks that came in as a result of, of that. So, um, you know, and, and to do those things, obviously, we rely very heavily on automation. Uh, automation, I mean, you know, the, the theme is, you know, valid. It's, it's the most important thing, um, I think, that enables us to achieve, you know, all of our, um, you know, where we're trying to get to from a security perspective, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, the NSM or the, the um, executive order and zero trust, you know, you're not going to get there without automation. Uh, but we've been working towards automation for many years to make things smarter and faster, um, you know, in terms of, you know, how do we do assessments of new capabilities quicker, um, you know, automate to some degree. The authorization process has been a, a long term goal of mine uh, to get to a point where, you know, we don't have to do so much manually. In fact, you know, for lower risk uh, things we should be able to automate those approvals and, and not spend a bunch of time on them because we really need to focus our time, our resources on, on you know, the, the more difficult, the more challenging problems that we have. And that's where I see automation, um, not just playing a big role in, in helping us deal with those bigger challenges, but helping to get the smaller challenges out of the way so that we can focus on the larger ones. Um, so that's, that's kind of a little bit about me uh, or a little bit about DHS and our mission. So with that, I'll turn it over. I guess done. Or back to you, Jason. Right, back to me because I get to I get to ask my follow up question because you know that's moderator's privilege. I, I want to go back to something you said in, in the automation side, providing intelligence, working with the state and local world. That's where automation and, and you know again we're talking about threat intelligence, but also the security side of it can really play a big role because there's 50 states. There's something like 3,000 counties, if I get that right, or 30,000 counties maybe. How are how is that kind of back and forth being automated to a certain extent? Is there something that you're doing or, or, or capabilities you're looking at to say how can we get accelerate that sharing of information, that threat intelligence, or whatever else you need to share? Yeah. So, well, a couple of things. So, you know, obviously reaching all of those different entities uh, requires a whole lot of work, infrastructure, um, access, remote access uh, into environments where we can you know, share that data. Um, you know, obviously some of it can be shared at the unclassified, you know, maybe FOU level, but, you know, some of it is classified and still needs to be shared. So that required, that has its own challenges with respect to infrastructure and the like, um, you know, but we, we're continually pursuing um, automations, especially like in microservices. Uh, we're, we're investing a lot right now in those kinds of microservices that will help enable us to share data. Uh, with those that need it, you know, better and faster. Um, yeah, there's, we have actually three or four projects going on right now today. But so I'd say that it's one of those areas where we've still got a lot to do, but we know what we need to do, and we're certainly pursuing that. 
All right. I, I, I see a future question coming for you, Eric. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you go bring in Sebastian, but uh, three to four projects that you're going on today. I may, I may have to ask you about what those are. So I'll get, I'll, I'll get your mind thinking. Uh, Sebastian Dunn from uh, Red Hat. Uh, automation, a big piece of what Red Hat does and what you all provide uh, to in terms of services. Tell us what you're seeing. Maybe tell us something we don't know over the next three to five minutes. Sure. So let me start with something I didn't know. I was doing a little research and I was reading about tool sprawl. So wondering where all these enormous um, cybersecurity budgets are going. And, you know, if you just Google security tools in use, things like that, what you'll find is numbers anywhere from, you know, 10 to 30. I saw another report where there's an average of 40 security tools in any given organization. I even saw numbers as high as 75 different security tools uh, in use in, in the average um, organization. And then, you know, I'm sure there's, you know, that 75 is probably, I hope it's an outlier, you know, maybe how they're defining those security tools. But, you know, not only is there the, the budget impact, but I'm also wondering if we're getting to a point with cooks in a kitchen, you know, where at some point there's got to be a diminishing return on these tools, maybe even, um, you know, a negative return on using these tools where they just can't be used effectively anymore by adding more tools. And then, of course, you need skilled IT staff to be running these tools. And that's another challenge that we're seeing, you know, with the great resignation, with just the competition for hiring and retaining, you know, all these skilled IT folks. So this is an increasing issue. Um, and then, of course, where do we put these security professionals? Um, you know, do they go in a silo with their own set of tools that don't necessarily interact with the operations team or the networking team or the, uh, the infrastructure team? All of these different groups have their own tools. And, you know, given the silos that are frequently in place, it's really hard for them to work together. So when we talk about automating security, we've got to address um, those silos as well, right? We have to come up with a way that we can automate across silos, across teams, you know, across teams with different management structures in order to be effective. And that's going to be, it's going to be tough. I love the discussion around the tools. And, and I've heard this time and again from folks in your position from the vendor community and, and Sebastian, I got to be honest, I always kind of point the finger back at, at, at the vendor community and say, well, isn't this your fault, right? Is, aren't you selling too many tools, right? And your tool doesn't integrate with my tool and, and that tool doesn't integrate with the other tool. And, and then the other piece of this, of course, is I don't know what all my tools do. How, how do you kind of work through that? How do you, when you talk to your customers, how do you ensure they know, hey, if we're buying, you know, Red Hat, I think it's called, a, uh, I may say it wrong, Ansible, is that right? If I'm right. Ansible, how do I know how to use it? Maybe you help us understand that because I think a lot of people may go, well, that's your fault, Sebastian. I'm buying too many tools. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky. And if we as Red Hat go into our agency customers and say, hey, we've got the perfect tool that you need next that's going to talk to all the other tools. But in a sense, you know, we, the way Red Hat works is we take the most innovative ideas from the open source community and then make those consumable by agencies you know, and enterprise organizations. And in this case, we are talking about, you know, an automation tool, not a security tool. We're not, you know, Red Hat is not a security company. We would say that, you know, we build security into everything we do, but we're not a security company. We're not competing with all these other tools. In fact, we're working with you to have all of those different tools talk with each other, to integrate those tools. You know, we see Ansible, Ansible automation as being sort of that glue between all the security tools, and even as that common language across your different teams. So in other words, your networking team, your infrastructure and ops team, your uh, security team can be leveraging sort of the same language, the same tools across, you know, across the organization. All right. I think, I think that's what I think a lot of people want to get to. Eric, I don't know if you want to jump in on that tool thing. We're going to do our first poll in a second, but Eric, real quick, just maybe talk about how you got to balance that tool. 
Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. I do want to actually it was one of the things I took. I wanted to talk about that. You know, um, you know, it's, it's, I've been with government now for uh, a little over a decade, and, and budget challenges have always existed, right? And there's always been, you know, it seems like vendors think we have this infinite source of money. We can just easily pull it out, and we can spend it in days or weeks. And the reality is, there's this massive budget process that goes on that takes years, and we plan years in advance, and it's not always easy to find, you know quick money. You know, that said, you know, there's also the reality that sometimes money comes available at the end of the year that's been unspent and things like that. And sometimes you, you can derive some opportunity there. But for the most part, you know, we're, we're stuck with the budget we planned for years ago. And, and sometimes new money comes in, but not often. And uh, when you're stuck with that budget, right, and somebody comes to you, hey, I've got this new great tool, you know, it'd be great if we could just uh, go ahead and buy that. But that's not always a reality. So, you know, what are you going to help me stop doing, right? Or what other tools can I stop using so that I can use your better tool, right? To fill more gaps in my infrastructure or my security program. So, you know, there's that trade-off that has to happen. And so, uh, you know, but you also talked about integrating tools, right? And how important that is. If the tools don't talk to each other and help create some kind of uh, in my opinion, anyway, right for my mission, my particular mission, I want I want an automated understanding of risk in real time. You know, where do I have weaknesses? Uh, where do I have vulnerabilities in my infrastructure? You know, what kind of threats are out there that could potentially exploit those based on how we operate, right? The operational context uh, for any given system. But you know, in order to get that real time visualization and understanding, you have to have integration, right, and and across tools in a meaningful way. And again, you know, because budgets are the way they are, it's you're not always able to do everything you want to do as quickly as you want to do it. So um, tools are great. They're fantastic. Um, but we have to find a way to kind of prioritize uh, incorporating them into our environment. And that's where we really need the vendors to help us understand those trade-offs. All right, let's jump into our first poll. Alyssa, I want you to bring the poll up. And uh, I've heard now that uh, Sebastian and Eric, you all can vote if you like. How important is automating cybersecurity functions in your agency? Hey, look at that. I hope everyone's saying at least very important, which is you know, not important, but we'll see what the re results say. Uh, we have a couple questions from the audience, so let's jump into those. Uh, um, uh, let's go, my, uh, my colleague Dave from FedScoop mentions, he writes, uh, Eric mentioned exploring automations at the National Vetting Center. Oh, look at that, very important, 91%. Uh, Eric mentioned exploring automations at the National Vetting Center. Is facial recognition being piloted, deployed? What forms or, or how is your office assessing that technology given recent privacy concerns? So obviously he's tagging back to some of the challenges uh, I think the IRS had with uh, another facial recognition. Uh, you want to kind of just touch upon the National Vetting Center and, and, and what's, what's going on there? Um, so I would love to get into really, you know, a whole lot more detail on that. Um, but uh, it's not something that I have direct oversight over. Um, so I am not familiar, however, with them using facial recognition currently, uh, as part of, uh, their process. I mean, it is very automated in that, uh, whereas before they had to manually work with say FBI and NCTC to adjudicate, you know, uh, somebody wanting to come into the country. We're now able to automate that across the IC to make sure that, you know, we're getting a holistic understanding of the person or persons that are trying to enter the country. And, and so it, in that way, it, it's really made a huge difference. Uh, there are, you know, I mentioned some projects earlier. There is one project that we're looking at that, you know, to speak to the privacy concerns um, that will help us determine uh, much more quickly whether someone's a U.S. person, right? Because that designation, right, of being a U.S. person uh, kind of changes, you know, what we can do and things like that with, with folks, right? We want to make sure that we are protecting uh, the privacy to the extent we're supposed to uh, when it comes to U.S. persons. So it's very important. Unfortunately, I can't speak to facial recognition. But. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate you able to at least uh, open the door a little bit and let us understand kind of what's going on with the National Vetting Center a little bit. And then obviously uh, some of the other projects. Let me let me do just a quick follow up on that project. Are you able to talk a little bit more about that vetting project or is it where is it in the process? You early stages planning? Uh, is it's it, it's early stages. It's um, it's beyond. Um, well, I'd say it's late planning, but it's it's getting ready to be developed. Uh, but we're not expecting that to be 
available for about one, another year. All right. All right. Another question from Dean. Dean asks uh, a couple of them, but let me start with the first one. Do you see the need for API security in a zero trust architecture? Uh, I'll, Sebastian or Eric, I'll throw it out to you, either one of you. Sebastian, take it away. So I think that's that's probably going to be a better question for the for the next panel. But what I I'll, I'll uh, uh, integrate it with automation in that I think it was our uh, Mr. Kirkendale, our our keynote speaker, mentioned that you know automation is implicit in the zero trust, and I think that's very true, right? Yeah, I could argue I would argue that you know there's no way we're going to do zero trust without automation. Um, and then just going back to something else that um, that Eric said, you talked about, um, you know, the difficulty in adding more tools given budget constraints and resource constraints. I also think automation needs to be thought of somewhat differently. In other words, automation is one of those things, one of the few things we can do in IT that actually gives gives value back in terms of time and resources. So if we start doing automation right. And we do have like ROI statistics that like show that this is happening. You're giving time back to those security administrators, back to those infrastructure teams. So they now have the time back in their schedule, you know, where they're not just keeping the lights on anymore, just responding to, to low level things. They can actually now work on higher level things and implementing more sophisticated tools and even more automation to keep things moving forward. So I think automation needs to be thought of as, is a little different than just adding another tool to, you know, another uh, burden to your IT staff. Yeah, and I'll, I'll pile on a little bit, um, you know, kind of add to the conversation. Uh, in terms of, you mentioned earlier about expertise, right? And making sure that our folks have the skills we need to have. And it's also hard to acquire those skills. It's hard to acquire the people that have those skills. Um, you know, and along those lines, like sometimes, you know, we let the capability get ahead of the security part, right? I mean, like the question about APIs, right? Of course, APIs need to be secure, right? But we started off, you know, using them before we, I think, completely appreciated them from a, from a security personnel perspective, right? Did we fully appreciate APIs, how they worked, how to secure them, and, and make sure that you know, we were doing our part to make sure that those APIs were secure when we, were, when we started using them. And, and I, I, it's a tough challenge, right? I think, you know, especially cloud is a really good example of, uh, at least from a government perspective, how our technology got ahead of our security professionals, right, in terms of expertise. And so we're playing a little bit of catch up there, right? Now the challenge gets even harder. We start talking about multi-cloud. Right. And then, you know, you're, you're trying to get expertise, you know, uh, developed in your folks, uh, you know, just to handle the first cloud you went to it. Now you're talking about going into other clouds. Right. So it, it, expertise is a big challenge. Um, you know, again, resources in general, whether it's money, whether it's people, all of things are a challenge. So even if you have the money to buy the tool, you know, do you have what does it take to effectively operate that tool? We talked about integration earlier, but. You know, what do you what do your personnel need to know, right, in order to make use of that tool effectively? A lot of times we buy tools and we we use, you know, 50 percent of them, you know, or 60 percent of them. You know, so there's there's that capability that goes, um, you know, unused. And, and so there's, a you know, an investment opportunity there as long as, you know, we can integrate and you have the people that know how to use it and things like that. But, um yeah, I think, you know, the, the person aspect of this is, you know, we talk a lot about automation, but automation works as long as the people know how to use it. Jason, may I add, that, add to that? Yeah, please, please go. Okay, so we talked about, you know, uh, Eric just talked about, you know, finding those, those skilled resources. Well, then there's retaining those skilled resources, right? And I believe I read recently, it was a, you know, CIO magazine article or something about how automation can actually help you retain those security professionals. So imagine you hire somebody at a high level who you want to work on something like API security. That's pretty sophisticated. Um, and if you bring them into your organization and have them doing rope work like reading through you know, email server logs and other security logs all day, guess what? You're not gonna keep them for very long. So again, the idea is automation would be to, you know, let's automate the lower level rote work that a machine and automation does best and you know, reserve the higher brain power work for, for the humans, for those skilled professionals that you wanna bring in and then keep in your organization. 
Absolutely. I'm glad we're bringing up the workforce because I saw an interesting statistic from um, the group IC squared and, and they said about 86% of all cybersecurity postings attract fewer than 10 applicants today. And uh, hiring would need to increase by something like 41% to meet all those job openings. So your security staff is probably, I'm guessing here, maybe understaffed. And if you're dealing with something to the effect of, you know, 10,000 alerts per day, and so much of it's manual, that's where the automation can also play a big role. And I think that's why we've seen the statistics and the surveys say, when you move to automation, it can really reduce the uh, stress on your security staff. Uh, again, uh, just to kind of build upon what you all were talking about. We have a couple other questions. Uh, so uh, Melissa writes, uh, how do you see automation playing a role in helping you meet last year's zero trust EO mandates? So uh, Eric, we'll start with you. It's, a, it's a, I think it's a softball question. She, 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 must, be, uh, she must know you. Well, I um, appreciate softballs, uh, no problem there. Uh, so, I mean, zero trust in general and automation, I mean, obviously there's an obvious connection there. Um, and for a government agency as large as DHS, right, achieving zero trust looks different depending on, you know, which systems we're talking about, so on and so forth. Of course, we want to take an enterprise approach to it. Um, you know, and that's where I think you just not to get off on a tangent, but you know, when it comes to cloud, multi-cloud, things like that, you need to understand, you need to have an enterprise plan for that. Um, otherwise you, you get behind and, uh, you find yourself having to possibly redo or refactor things because you didn't take the right things into consideration up front, but, you know, zero trust, um, you know, it, like I said, it's going to look different depending on where you sit. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, where you don't have it, obviously getting multi-factor authentication in place, uh, federated identity, uh, you know, very important to making sure that we get to zero trust. But, you know, when it kind of comes down to the data, right? And I can really see automation playing a big role in how we secure our data properly. In a zero trust environment, role-based access controls aren't enough, right? We, we, need to, we need to assign attributes to people and things to make sure that we're making the right kinds of access decisions um, and, 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 you know, uh, exposing the right data to the right people or things at the right time. And, um, you know, there's a lot of data out there. Uh, there's lots of data coming in uh, very quickly and, and, um, and in great volumes. And so assigning those attributes to that data, you know, not just the data that's coming in today or the data that's going to come in tomorrow, but the data that we already have, making sure that, you know, we do have all those right attributes in place. I think there's room for automation there. Um, and that would go a long way to helping us uh, with that problem. I mean, every technology is going to have its limitations. Encryption, in, uh, you know, for data, you know, in transit and arrest, very important, right? But it's not the end all be all. If somebody were to, you know, acquire somebody else's credentials, then, you know, encryption doesn't necessarily do you any good because, you know, that particular um, a uh, bad actor could decrypt whatever it is you have encrypted anyway that that user would normally have access to. So, you know, attributes are important in securing them. And I, I see automation playing huge roles in, in identity and access management. Sebastian, you want to talk a little bit about what, what Red Hat has seen and, and what you wrote when you talked to your customers about that move to zero trust, which I, I you know every customer is probably asking you. Uh, where does automation play? I know the DevSecOps model is one example. Yeah, and I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued, especially by um, and validated by Eric's you know, frequent men mention of cloud and hybrid cloud. Um, and because of course, we, as we all move there and move to hybrid cloud, we need to carry our automation with us. And in fact, I would argue that's even perhaps even more important than cloud, in other words, Automating in our on-premise data centers was pretty hard. The cloud was actually designed to be automated against from the beginning. And I would argue that if you aren't automating as you move things into the cloud, you're not going to you know, reach those, those cost savings or anything else that you're trying to get out of cloud. And, and it, I don't want to end on a negative note, but, but we see that very, very often with our customers. You know, they have somebody has a mandate to move to the cloud and they do what we call just a straight lift and shift. And at the end of the day, they're very disappointed when they don't see any value out of doing that. In fact, they might even be spending more money. They've simply moved their servers and their resources to a different data center, just happens to be called cloud. 
So <laughs> yeah, we got to, you know, I would argue that cloud was really a driver of some of these automation technologies, right? You had these open APIs that the cloud providers were giving you, you know, so that you, they were giving you the opportunity and you just had to grab an automation tool and start using it against the cloud. So um, yes, absolutely. With zero trust, no matter where you are, cloud or on-premise, um, you're going to have to make sure that, that so, you know, the, base, the basis behind zero trust, you're going to hear more of this in a few minutes, but, you know, is that you have to, um, everybody has to be verified. Every, every have to, you have to validate what something or who something is before they're allowed to communicate. And the only way you can ensure that every piece in your system is thinking that way and configured that way is to automate it and automate it in a way that you can then make sure that it stays that way. Right. It needs to be, um, you know, we need to prevent drift from those configurations as well. And I think part of that is why you see the zero trust strategy playing such a big role. Again, I did a, just a quick search and found seven different uh, mentions of automation. Now, some of it's specifically to that section of automation, but it's, it's also throughout the entire document. Uh, let's go to the next poll. Alyssa, bring up the next poll. What are the potential costs of not having sufficient automation around cybersecurity? All right, good, 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 good question. And we'll get, let folks get a chance to answer it. In the meantime, we got another question. Uh, this one comes from, again, Dave. Uh, Eric, this one's for you again. He wants to go back to something around data sets and, and are there specific data sets you're prioritizing with automation and anything you can tell us about what's on your wish list? All right, that's a good question. Uh, let me start with my wish list, I guess, is, is you know, um, well, how do, I, how do I say this? So, you know, like I said earlier, different uh, environments are starting from different places. And, and, you know, we've always kind of relied on, especially our classified systems being, you know, relatively protected against a lot of those external threats, right? So uh, automation around, you know, ensuring that the folks that we trust to be on those systems, you know, and, and making sure that we can continue to trust them over time has been a, a big priority in terms of automation in the past. But, you know, the, the reality is, you know, actors get more sophisticated, um, but, you know, access and ensuring access between environments um, has really kind of, it, it's gone to a whole nother level than it has in the past. And, and in order to do that, you have to be able to share between domains. And sharing between domains means, you know, making sure that you have secure cross domain and that, you know, you, that you know what's going on in that cross domain situation. But it also means that you kind of, you start to open yourself up to external threats, you know, cascading up from, from below. And, um, you know, so that, you know, automation around that and ensuring that we are doing the right kind of monitoring to make sure that we're keeping, you know, the, the bad actors out, you know, keeping them from traversing lower level environments to get into higher level environments, um, you know, is, is key, right? So we want to make sure that we're doing a really good job at monitoring. Uh, so not just for the trusted insider anymore on the high side, but for all kinds of uh, potentially nefarious activity. So, you know, automation around, around that um, is very important. You know, and again, because they've been um, a lot of these classified systems are inside buildings where, you know, multi-factor is kind of harder to do, we'll say. It's not as easy. I can't use my cell phone for multi-factor authentication in, in a secure environment. Um, so, you know, my options start to get a little limited or you start to then look at, uh, you know, you know, tokens and things like that that you have to carry around with you. So, um, so we're looking at, you know, how do we solve those problems in the most, um, you know, cost effective, but also forward looking way uh, to make sure that we are going where, you know, the IC wants to go, you know, down the road so that we're all kind of operating from the, you know, from, from in, a, in a similar fashion. All right, uh, Sebastian, do you want to maybe address as well that that data the data question around securing uh, and automating data? A lot of automation depends on data feeds and where you're getting your data from. And can you not just trust your data, of course, but the, the authoritative data? And then how are you using the data going forward? Is, is there something that you can talk around uh, the, the data piece as well? Yeah, I think so. One of the advantages of... Um, you know, certain automation platforms, and I would say Ansible is certainly one of them, is that 
it, you know, because it's supported by the community and by the vendors themselves. In other words, we at Red Hat aren't the ones that write the integrations with, you know, server vendors and, and, um, and security vendors and storage vendors. Um, what that means is that Ansible can talk to all of those things, whether it's network devices, security devices, or even storage devices. So we do actually have customers that are configuring their storage in an automated fashion. This, this didn't use, used to happen at all, but they're configuring their storage in that automated fashion, you know, imposing security standards on it, and then using that automation to ensure that it stays in that secure state. So again, it, it, it's not that autom we didn't want to do automation in the past. It's just automation is now possible in a way that it wasn't, you know, given the innovation that's come out of that open source community. I think that's a that's a great point. And I hear that time and again when we talk about cybersecurity. Why are things different today? I did a panel, a different topic, customer experience, and said, why are we so focused today versus six years ago, five years ago? It's always been important. And that, that was the same kind of theme. Just the changes in technology and the what what the cloud does and the understanding of data and the integration that's happening is really driving these these changes. I just want to remind folks, we've got about uh, nine minutes or so left on the panel. So please continue to send in your great questions. I really appreciate it. In the meantime, uh, let's go down a, a path around risk management. I think this is the other piece that automation can help with when agencies are trying to kind of look at their risks. And we're talking about risks to systems and applications. We're talking about supply chain, a very hot topic these days. And maybe Eric, start us off with how is automation and, and the data helping you balance and mitigate your the risks that you face every day? Yeah, um, great question. Uh, so it's always been a passion of mine to um really speed up and make smarter the authorization process the assessment authorization process around risk management right so um and so to that end you know because in the beginning it's for a very long time it's been very hard to do um it requires a lot of work we talked about that earlier kind of starting to automate the uh more you know the 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 lower tasks, right? The things that don't require quite as much expertise, the, the more binary activities, if you will. But, um, you know, speeding up authorization is critically important, not just because I want to make the authorization process faster just to make it faster. It's to get those capabilities out there quicker that enable, you know, those, those in harm's way, uh, you know, to get the intelligence that they need, the data that they need in order to be secure um, or, or to save lives, things like that. Um, I've had the benefit of, of being uh, very close to operations for a number of years. And, and, you know, you get to see the direct effect that some of these capabilities uh, have on, you know, the lives of others. And, and so when you develop an appreciation for that, you don't want to get something like risk management processes in the way, right? You want to get them out of the way as much as possible. And you do that, obviously, through through automation. And, you know, we talked a little about data sets and I you know, kind of felt like I didn't completely answer the question you know, as far as, you know, what kind of data sets are, are you know, that we are we're looking to protect. I mean, obviously, you know, classified data sets are classified because they're important and you always want to protect those. It's pretty obvious, um, you know, and then data sets around, you know, privacy information and, you know, uh, very important, right? When that... If you were to expose that, obviously there's a significant consequence to that. And then an agency like DHS, obviously, you know, we have privacy information that we need to protect. And so, you know, making sure that we're doing a very good job around that, because it's not all necessarily in your protected, you know, classified enclaves. Um, some of that is having to be uh, operated on in unclassified environments. So you want to make sure that you get the right kind of protections around that. And, you know, understanding, you know, what that looks like from a risk management perspective all the time, like I said earlier, and having that real-time visualization understanding of that risk that risk picture uh, becomes crucial because you need to know that when, say, a new, you know, exploit or a new vulnerability is discovered, you know, then, you know, how are we uh, vulnerable to that particular exploit, so on and so forth. And if you're able to you know, kind of put that data into a system or collect it in real time and then generate some kind of, uh, you know, uh, risk picture, that's where you're going to be able to really defend yourself because you'll be able to focus your, 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 um, your, your, your audit resources, your monitoring resources against, you know, very specific things that will help you hopefully find uh, nefarious activity faster. And, and we don't 
have enough of it today. You know, like for example, uh, somebody does get somebody else's credentials and gets into that environment, right? There's so many different ways that that could look. And if you're not looking at it across the spectrum, like for example, you know, whether it's badge records, so you know they're in the building or not in the building, um, suddenly they're, you know, logging in from a different IP address somewhere else. You know, the whole IP thing gets harder because you do have legitimate VPN endpoints, you know, in say, you know, in your home country or in your home state that could make it look like they're local. Um, so that challenge is a little harder, but more often than not, I think you'd probably find that they're coming from different endpoints, different places at different times, and it probably does not look like the activity you expect from your employees to be engaging in, right? So, you know, if you're able to key on those things, which are hard to key on today, um, you'll be able to protect your data a lot better. But it's also making sure that you've got the right rules in place, um, that people are following those rules. I mean, it's one thing to say authorize an environment for, you know, data up to level you know, C, right? And then people start putting level D, E, and F data in there uh, that's not supposed to be in there. How do you know, right? And then when you usually find that out is when somebody has, something bad has happened and you're like, oh, what did we lose? Well, we lost A, B, C, D, E, and F, right? And it's like, oh, that wasn't supposed to be there. So, you know, you got to have the right kind of rules around it, but you got to make sure people are following the rules and maybe some of that is education. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, uh, well, it probably is education a lot of the times, but, you know, making sure that we're enforcing the rules, uh, you know, is inc incredibly important. Sebastian, it sounds like it comes down to, again, we're talking about data, how much data there is. There's just too much data. You can't keep up with all the data. And that's where that automation can play such a big role and understand what data you have, but also how to manage that data. Is, is that really the, the, key, the key piece here to this conversation? Actually, I got something a little different from what Eric was saying. I, I what I kept hearing was <laughs> what I kept hearing was time. You know, the reduction in time, the reduction in time to deploy new capabilities. And as long as our our staffs are spending, you know, eighty, they say in the government, maybe ninety percent of the time just keeping the lights on. That means that they're delayed or even prevented from deploying those new capabilities. And that's what's needed, you know, that security risks are changing constantly. And, you know, we're in a struggle to keep up. And if we don't automate the simple stuff so that our most skilled resources can work on the new and most important stuff, we're, you know, we're, we're leaving money on the table or, you know, however you wanna say it, we're, we're not getting where we need to be. And also with respect to time, um, you know, there's a different difference between, you know, a vulnerability that we may find that are on our systems and then the time when that vulnerability is then exploited. So who knows, you know, that could be minutes, that could be hours, that could be years. Um, but the sooner we close those gaps, the better. So the sooner we are able to detect a vulnerability and then automate the remediation of that vulnerability, you know, we're closing that window where our systems are the most vulnerable. So there's another way that, you know, automation can, can help with risk management and our overall security posture. And if you don't mind, I'll add to that real quick. A lot of times, you know, um, uh, there's a chance that, you know, from the time it's identified, you were talking about the time it's identified to the time that there's an exploit out there. In some cases, the exploit exists before you discover the vulnerability, right? I mean, and, and so it's actively being exploited. And if it's actively being exploited, what does that look like in your environment, right? So, and that's where I think response and automating response is incredibly important. But at the same time, you know, there's something was probably happening in, the, happening in that environment that would have clued you in that there was something wrong going on, whether that's the amount of data going out, where it's going out to, what have you, that would have exposed that, um, that activity a little sooner. So I think, you know, time is everything, right? Time to response, but, you know, again, you know, finding things before we're necessarily made aware of them, you know, is, is important and it's a hard challenge. Let's do our final poll question. Uh, we got about a minute left in our panel, so perfect timing. There it is. Which one of these is not an auto automation tool? Uh-oh, uh, that's, a, that's a trick question, I think. Um, I, I wanna go back to something that you both said, time, and, and I think one of the things that, that I've seen when I did some research is it, something like most vulnerabilities take something like 200 days to, to, until you find out, like the time between when the attack happens and when the, the Security Operations Center, whomever figures out, I think on average is something like 200 days. 
And if you can uh, go into Sebastian's point, if you can cut that to 100 days or to five days or to one day or one hour, that's going to keep you much uh, safer. Uh, so in our last minute, while the poll answers come up, uh, Eric, Sebastian, you guys have done a great job. Let's quickly do a, a quick, uh, what's our big takeaway from today? What should, what do you want? What's the message you want to leave with the uh, uh, audience here? Sebastian, since you were second, first, you go first, second, you get my drift. So I, on almost all my automation discussions, I, I sort of end on just get started, you know, just do it, you know, use a Nike logo, you know, automation is one of those few IT projects where you, you know, you don't have to go big or, or go home. You can start right now, use it as a point tool, start solving problems right now, you know, think about whatever that next project is that you're going to start working on and, and uh, put automation in at the beginning of that project. You can always grow, you can always mature, you know, but we're not going to get anywhere if we don't at least get started with automating our IT processes. All right. And, and Eric, you get the last word. I uh, would have liked to have gone first because you said everything I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so I agree. I mean, you know, I was thinking about zero trust and just getting started. And that's very much, you know, we're developing, you know, uh, plans, right? They're going to take us out a couple of years to get where we want to get to. Um, but, um, you know, so it, it is important to get started. And, and, you know, for the vendors that are out there, understand, you know, that, you know, automation is obviously key, but integrating those automations into some kind of process or view that gets us to real-time understanding is incredibly important. Um, you need to have real, for those of you that are responsible for cybersecurity of your environments, if, if you're not working towards, you know, a real-time understanding and automated risk decisions at, at some level, then, um, then I think you're probably uh, behind the curve a little bit. That's just Eric's opinion. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, we've got to automate away a lot of the lower level, lower risk things that are in our way that are preventing us from doing higher level activities um, increasing the pace of automation, you know, not just that we buy, but that we're building in-house in our DevOps environments and so forth. And, and obviously, you know, because of that saying, but baking, you know, security into that DevOps infrastructure so that you can have an automated decision at the end of that process. Very important. All right. Well, on that note, you know, let's give uh, both Sebastian and Eric a big round of applause virtually. Of course, you guys did a great job, of course, and, and learned a lot. And I'll pass it back to Alyssa. Alyssa, thank you very much as well. Thank you, guys. That was a great panel. Thank you so much. Up next, we have ATARG's very own Kirsten Padden moderating for us. So Kirsten, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Alyssa. And before we begin, I just want to encourage the audience to please engage with us on this panel and submit questions of your own throughout the discussion. You can use the Q&A section button down below in order to submit those questions. And also remember to answer the poll questions as we go to ensure that you receive your CPE credit. So with that, I'm gonna have each of our panelists go ahead and introduce yourselves. Uh, tell us who you are, what agency you're with, what role you have there, and anything else you'd like to share with our group up top. Uh, let's start with Michael, please. You're muted, Michael, I can't hear you. Or maybe it's an audio. I think there might be an audio issue there. So uh, we'll go right back to Michael. Um, let's move over to Vince next, please. Everybody can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep, awesome. So uh, my name is Vincent Svertipan. I work for DHS CISA, uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency uh, in, a, in the Cybersecurity Division uh, within a group called Capacity Building. So. I'm actually a, a section chief within uh, the Cyber Quality Service Management Office, uh, working a lot of things, everything from secure cloud business applications to mobile cybersecurity shared services. I really uh, I appreciate the opportunity to join the, the panel today with esteemed uh, speakers here. Um, I'll note that you know what we're doing in the space, you can see a lot of pieces within um, zero trust uh, pieces. Um, one of the pieces that I actually, you know, really interested in and, and at least to contribute to this panel and actually get people's input is uh, we, we did a publication more recently on applying uh, zero trust principles to enterprise mobility. That was just uh, released last month. It's actually due uh, in April uh, 18th or the 20th, I believe. It, it, there was a two, two different publication dates, but uh, actually what, what I'll note is that we did have a publication pushing for you know, a lot of zero trust architecture, very great that we're trying to get there. It's a journey, 
But the fact is mobile devices is, is actually another, another IT asset, right? And we actually have to think of that. And it's a great opportunity to leverage existing technologies today, right? Various mobile security technologies, um, whether you're managing and trying to configure and protect the device, looking at continuous authentication, authorization for identity, um, right? Trying to build high confidence and, and, and actually doing things like automation. I saw the previous panel around application security testing, right? How can we uh, do things like mobile application vetting and automate the workflow uh, and integrate those into regions that can think of mobile threat defense and others. So there's a lot of current day technologies that can get you started towards your journey for zero trust. Um, we're working on a variety of not only uh, guidance and, and publication, but also shared services. So in the mobile space. So very much happy in here to, to be here today and present uh, with, with other colleagues here. So uh, that's us in a nutshell. Thank you, Vince. Appreciate that. And then let's jump over to Michael again. Yeah, hopefully my audio is fixed this time. All right. Uh, so Mike Epley, uh, Chief Architect and Security Strategist for Red Hat North America, and uh, also working with our and running a lot of our zero trust initiatives uh, through Red Hat. And I'm glad we just talked about automation in the last session of the panel, because I think that's critical to getting to zero trust uh, in order for us to do the kind of dynamic uh, access controls for us to you know, do individualized and transaction-based authorization and authentication. It's important that we you know, start from that foundation of uh, automation and build that into everything that we do uh, towards zero trust. Uh, and then you know, we talk about uh, zero trust also is kind of a new paradigm. And as we shift towards uh, implementing zero trust security controls and security boundaries, it's going to be important to you know keep keep in mind the the base level of hardening and security that we need to provide uh, for our systems, so we can provide that default deny all capability from the outset. And that's been at the forefront of Red Hat's done in terms of hardening and preparing uh, our open source technologies for that type of uh, uh, footprint. Thanks. Thank you. Let's jump over to Rob next, please. All right, let's see if my audio is working. Everyone sounded like chipmunks for a while there. So uh, <laughs> hopefully everyone can hear me and I don't sound like a, a chipmunk. Um, Rob Thorne, I'm the ICE Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, I've been with ICE uh, now for well over 11 years uh, and I've been in my current position uh, for uh, about six years. Um, so I've been through a number of different administrations uh, and seen a lot of different direction uh, and spins on cybersecurity. But this is probably the, the, the most excited I've been. It, you know, I think heading towards zero trust is going to be uh, very good for us from a, a U.S. government perspective and, and get us to where we need to be so we can provide our mission space uh, the capabilities that they need. Um, here at ICE, we started our zero trust journey uh, about three or four years ago. We took somewhat of a crawl, walk, run approach. Some areas were still crawling, other areas were running and, and doing very well. But it's really been interesting to kind of see zero trust evolve over time into more cybersecurity disciplines. And often when I talk to my peers, um, you know, there's really not a universal agreement on exactly what zero trust means um, or how to implement zero trust itself. So I always tell folks, well, it really depends on your environment uh, and what you have and the amount of funding that you, you have. Here at ICE, we see zero trust more of a, of a, as a strategy. Uh, we look at it as an enabler to um, modernize our network uh, and get technology to our law enforcement officers, the latest and greatest. So when we look across some of the pr uh, uh, priorities that we have, our strategic priorities, one of them is, is our accelerated service delivery model. And what we're trying to do there is deliver secure and reliable solutions out to our mission space at the speed of mission. So a great example of that from a zero trust perspective um, is moving away from those inflexible and rigid capabilities such as vir virtual private network and moving towards more of a secure service edge capability. Um, so that's just one example of, of the work that, that we're doing. But what I wanna do is really quickly uh, before I end here is jump back into technology. I said earlier that our, our mission space wants technology. They wanna be agile. They want to have data at their fingertips, whether they're in the office or out in the field. So uh, mobile is exactly what they want. They want to have the latest iPhone. They want to have the Android. Um, so it's going to be challenging going forward to actually secure these devices. And what I mean by that is to make them useful and to provide them with a good user experience. 
So today, hopefully I can provide some of those insights into what we're doing here at ICE, as well as we're going with Zero Trust. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rob. And Bill, I know we heard from you earlier today, but for those who just joined us, let's go ahead and have you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Bill Kirkendale. I'm the Chief Information Officer for the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency for the District of Columbia, which is a lot to spit out. We call ourselves CSOSA. We are responsible for pro probation and parole in DC for the most part, um, supervising about 8,000 offenders on any, any given day and uh, during their compliance with uh, court orders and, um, and release conditions and uh, also trying to rehabilitate them and you know, bring them back into the community. So we've got about 12 sites in the city, 1,000 users, uh, a little over 1,000 users. And uh, um, we are, you know, I, I'm very excited about Zero Trust. I, uh, like Rob, am, uh, my ambitions are to uh, uh, bring it to, uh, bring, you know, more services to, to our users and, um, and with, more ease. Um, of course, there will be some uh, some catches uh, with folks that uh, aren't, you know, conditioned to using, you know, some of the aspects of authentication or multi-factor or verifying who you are using uh, government issued equipment and things like that. But um, you know, it's uh, it's it's very exciting. I think the the, the opportunity is, like Rob said, uh, the modernization efforts. Uh, uh, can accelerate. And I think over the last couple of years, obviously, this remote work that we've been um, operating, uh, conditions we've been operating under has also helped to accelerate it. So I think there's a good confluence of timing with everybody being, you know, uh, uh, comfortable with um, remote access and then taking that a step further, not having to come into our network for every resource um, and just, you know, getting inside and having that implicit trust within the network, but having explicit trust to, you know, things outside. So... It's my story and I'm sticking with it. All right, thank you. Thank you all for the intros and um, sharing that information with us. So the first question that I wanna pose is, what does the concept of never trust always verify mean? And maybe we could start with Michael, please. Uh, the concept from your perspective of never trust always verify. Yeah, thanks. Uh, appreciate uh, that question because uh, I think it's important and I mentioned this in the introduction, uh, to think about zero trust mostly from the idea of uh, individualizing your access controls. So for every actor, for every resource uh, that you deal with, every time they interact, you're going to make a new access decision, uh, whether or not you're gonna allow or not deny that access. And that's really turning the traditional security model on its head because uh, previously, we had this idea of implicit trust. You might authenticate once or be have access to a system by the fact that you're on the intranet uh, in your corporate network. Uh, and we're no longer going to rely on that implicit trust anymore. Instead, every single time uh, you're going to interact with that resource, we're going to make a new decision. So that's kind of where automation really comes into play in order to, to do that, you know, uh, and users don't want to have to re-authenticate every time or reassert their, their business requirements or needs or uh, sign in again with their new, with their credentials every time they use, uh, say, a new web application or navigate to, to their system or log in or pick up their iPhone. Uh, so automation is going to pay, play an absolutely critical role to making zero trust acceptable to our users and our systems and to enable system to system and non-person uh, interactions with those uh, systems, as well as you know, doing things like we talked in the last session uh, a little bit about kind of doing a risk assessment. You know, you're not just gonna allow access just because somebody asked for it. You're gonna do an individualized risk assessment every time you do that. And you're gonna need to automate the tools to collect the information for performing that risk assessment, as well as the context information about the actors and the type of transaction and, and business function that they're performing. Uh, and that's really what Zero Trust is, is asking us to do, is to, to do all that every single time uh, for our users and for our systems. Great, thank you. Do any of our panelists have an additional perspective they would like to share weighing in on that question? Hey, this is Vincent. I'll just note that, you know, a lot of times ne never trust always verify definitely for mobile is, is something where people, there's a misconception that sometimes, that, Hey, therefore there's no more perimeter security or there's no more defense in depth. Right. Um, there's th those concepts still apply. The only difference is for mobile. And, and honestly, it makes it easier is 
the building of, of higher confidence, right? Uh, being able to do continuous authentication and authorization based on a variety of technologies, right? Gate technology, other you know, geofencing sensors and others, but never trusting makes a lot of sense, right? And always verifying, um, but being able to stick to some of the key principles of, of defense in depth and others to help build confidence over time, especially in the mobile environment, really enables us to, to better meet those zero trust architectures, really as, you, as you, you're progressing in your journey. So I just wanted to make a note that it's not just, uh, definitely the automation of workflow is critical and key because you can't actually keep up with it uh, without that. But um, it's not that, you know, we throw everything out from before. It's just that, you know, the, the concepts around, well, I have a, a trusted, you know, network is not necessarily there. Implicit trust is, is relinquished in this case, right? But uh, how we do it and how we leverage some of the best practices are still applicable to, to help us get there. Thanks, Vincent. So um if I could, if I may jump in just really quick, just a point, Vincent made a really good point. You know, it's both user and device, but I like when he mentioned the term defense in depth, and that's really what zero trust is going to provide us. Because when you look at kind of recent breaches that we've had, once you get into that soft, chewy core, you know, for, you, 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 you breach the perimeter, you can laterally move. And, and we just can't defend that anymore. So that the zero trust piece, exactly what Mike talked about and Vincent said is, is gonna protect us from that, or at least help us defend our networks a, a lot better. Thank you all for that insight. Um, Vincent, the next question I have is for you to kick us off is why should mobile devices need special consideration when implementing zero trust? Um, specifically within the federal law enforcement agencies. Yeah, so, so in general, I think mobile devices uh, need special considerations when implementing zero trust, just because of the fact that, you know, the ubiquity of mobile devices honestly have a, a larger, right, the, the, the actual sensors on the device and what you have available is, is much greater. Um, architecturally, also, it is different, right? And so, um, truthfully, uh, I believe that mobile is actually a prime candidate to help us get to zero trust faster, because why? Uh, unlike... Uh, our traditional backbone networks or even cloud and other pieces where you have uh, trusted networks or trying to build your own bubble sometimes, right? Some of the older concepts, um, you would see that mobile devices run on networks we don't control, right? Carriers and, and whether in the in CONUS or in the US or outside the US, there's a lot there that we have to understand that there's a lot in the environment we don't control. Um, I do think that mobile itself um, is, is just another asset, but it does uh, need special considerations for zero trust because of things like, you know, I, uh, app isolation, right? Micro segmentation. It's inherently built with zero trust in mind. If you uh, don't, not to pat, you know, all the OEMs on the back, but the truth is the platform providers, Apple, Google, they actually build those types of things in so that this is why when you see, you know, different types of cloud breaches and others, you don't, you don't see it in mobile. It's not a large enterprise wide scale of when I compromise one device, I end up compromising and spreading it across. Um, zero trust concepts are actually built in already to the platform. So it, there is special considerations because it's a different attack vector, whether you're going over cellular or your traditional Wi-Fi, but also the fact is the architecture is different. The capabilities actually bring you closer to zero trust. So. But hopefully that helps. Yeah, yeah I'd like to jump in there too, in the because we we talked about uh, uh, lateral movement a moment ago, and and I think the intersection of that and mobile devices really demonstrates why we need zero trust as well, uh, because as noted, you know these things don't run unprotected and trusted networks, and that same device is operating on an unprotected network, and then you know the the user is going to bring that in and maybe connect to the Wi-Fi inside your enterprise. Uh, and immediately they're going to be in what would normally be that trusted uh, network boundary. And that's why we need this layered defense. Uh, we need to reauthorize that device for that Wi-Fi. We need to re now reauthorize that interaction because that device, even if the device itself isn't compromised, the application or the network or something else, other component on that device might be compromised or the user might be compromised. And so we need to continuously reauthorize that and then not rely on the device boundary or that Wi-Fi as the primary or only means of isolating that device from those enterprise systems that you might now be connected to. And really, you know, that's the heart of zero trust is we're going to reauthorize. We're going to not 
not rely on the fact that that device is now just attached to that Wi-Fi network uh, in order to authorize it. Thank you. And uh, Bill, I would like to hear from you next on another question, but did you have something you'd like to add to that? No, question? go ahead. That's all right. Okay, great. So um, my question was going to be when it comes to challenges or rather what challenges will agencies experience as they begin to incorporate zero trust? Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, first and foremost, I think it's just a cultural shift, right? I mean, it's just, a, it's a thought, uh, you know, the state of mind sort of thought process. Folks are, look, they're in their own little worlds, depending on what your area of expertise is or responsibility and bringing everybody together for a common, you know, for, you know, with a common understanding that, you know, our goals are to be aligned with these principles and, um, and not to mention the fact that we have things that we have to do. Uh, regardless, uh, because of uh, what OMB is mandated. So, um, so getting, you know, folks there, uh, you know, I had a discussion with my uh, uh, network guy the other day, I said, you know, I'm going to get rid of all your firewalls. And he said, No, you're not. <laughs> and I said, said, well, I don't really mean that. But, um, but I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to have folks, you know, just be able to connect to these applications um, from wherever they are, uh, over the internet, and, um, you know, not have to have uh, have them come into the network and you know which is his responsibility so um so it's that sort of thing and it's uh it's going to be you know and, and he understands it and he says he's been reading up on it and everything but it's um it's not going to happen tomorrow or next year there's going to be although there's some things that we have to do by next year it's going to be a process and a journey and i think the first thing to do is to sort of you know rein in all this all these require all these things that we're talking about um, across the spectrum of these pillars, and then um, and not just go you know and not look at these tools specifically and what they can do, but uh, come up with a strategy and and in, in incorporate not only your IT staff and security staff and operational staff, um, DevOps folks, uh, but but you've got to uh, make it a uh, you've got to extend that to your stakeholders. Of course, it's going to take money, so I've got to get my. Uh, uh, COO, C, uh, COO, CFO, and director to understand it and to buy in. So there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. And going with challenges, Vince, what challenges lie ahead for incorporating zero trust when it comes to mobility? Yeah. So, so beyond the, I, I definitely uh, empathize with the the resourcing piece, right? Um, that is a w without that, that that's a really hard challenge. However, I think. Looking at zero trust for mobility uh, and just zero trust architecture in general as a, an entire architecture going forward, building that strategy, I will note that um, specifically that uh, I think that as people get down the road, so I, I always push for leverage existing technologies today, right, to do uh, what you can in, in starting your journey towards zero trust. But further down the line, I think the integration pieces um, to, in order to orchestrate or automate workflows is going to be a, an area that will be a challenge lie ahead because in mobile, um, the ecosystems are somewhat fragmented in the, in the security space. You're going to find, hey, those folks really focus on, um, you know, EMM uh, device management or protection, mobile defense, uh, mobile application vetting. When we try to string those orchestration pieces together, it's not as seamless as, as folks would like. I think that along the lines of, well, how do I deal with mobile? And then how do I do with traditional enterprise and integrate that together to build a zero trust architecture, um, right? Is, is gonna be a challenge. And, and as people get, this is why I think as people go further down the line, you'll see the, the governance, right? The visualization, those you think would be pretty easy, but until you can figure out the integration points, you can't get to that. Right. So that's where I think that the challenges lie with actual implementation. Whoops. Thank you. Um, so we'll take a pause right there and we'll throw up our first poll question. But that being said, are there any other comments around this conversation from our panelists? Um, Rob, I see you mocking me. Did you have an additional comment? Yeah, I, I do. You know, I, I brought up earlier, um, I agree with what Vince said. You know, I, I think the integration piece is going to be challenging. You know, you have one vendor product that can provide certain capabilities, but but maybe it doesn't provide another. And what I mean by that is, you know, we, we use derived credentials and, and some support it, some don't. So, you know, that we see as a key capability that we want. So we have to be wary of that and understand that. 
um, as well as integrations with your mobile threat defense. And I'll use the term defense and I'll get to that in just a moment and your, your MDM capabilities, et cetera. But I think the big thing, and I said it before, was user experience with the mobile devices. And I think that's a big one because everyone wants to have the same experience that they have with their mobile device or with their laptop that they have. They want to have the same experience on their mobile devices. And right now we don't have that. Um, at ICE, what we do is we have a, a container solution where you can get to email and, and all of the, the data remains within that containerized capability. So we have what I call dual persona where you have your native operating system and we kind of let folks do what they want on, on that side. We have implemented Secure Service Edge on our, our mobile devices, which gives us some more insight into the traffic and what people are, uh, where they're going. But we still kind of have that dual persona. So I think the challenge for us is how do we get that same user experience going forward for these individuals without letting security get in the way? I think Zero Trust is going to enable that and help that. I, I really do. But I think we've got to be, um, be wary of that. And then getting into the uh, mobile threat defense uh, piece and why I said defense. It's kind of interesting when I look at uh, the technologies on the mobile devices. Five years ago, uh, we invested in mobile threat detection capability, which was looking at applications and the behavior. In working with those vendors, they now are using terms such as mobile um, endpoint detection and response. I've seen mobile threat detection. So it's really how you kind of market the capability. And from a CISO's perspective, you've got to really look at those products and capabilities and say, okay, when you say that term, what do you really mean? Are you looking at threats? Is it user or is it application? So I think that's another area that's a challenge is, is understanding the vendor products, uh, and what their capabilities are and really digging into them to see if they're going to provide you the security that you need on these mobile devices. Thank you, Rob. And also, while we have you here, Rob, I haven't started a question with you yet. So I was going to pose the question, uh, what are some of the steps that agencies can take to implement a secure zero trust system? So some of those first initial, you know, advice you'd give. Yeah, so that's really kind of the, the broad question. And when I when I tell folks this, I often say, you know, I feel like I'm a mosquito in a, in a nudist camp. You know, where do I start? Where do I go? Um, and, and the reality is, is like I said earlier, it really depends on your environment and where you're mature and where you're not mature. So the approach that we're taking here at ICE is very much of a risk based approach. Uh, so I've got two things that are going on right now. Um, one, I think, uh, I, I've got somewhat of a, a little bit of a gap analysis going on where I've got a, a team going in and saying, Hey, what tools and capabilities do we have in place, uh, right now? How can we better integrate those products? How can we better use those products? products to get us those zero trust concepts that, that we need. The other group that I've got working is we've selected an application a, a system and we've said, all right, we've got to, we've got to uh, make this internet facing. So let's start to wrap zero trust concepts around this and see what we can do at this point. So we're kind of learning on, on two fronts. So I would say, that, and, and then what we're doing, if I may, is we're, we're approaching it from an identity perspective. So I said a, a risk-based approach. I really think if you if you you solve the identity piece, you're buying yourself time. You're reducing a lot of surface area or attack area, uh, and you can look further down the line to say, hey, how do I need to improve in micro segmentation? Some of the other concepts within within zero trust. Uh, so that's the ICE approach. It may not fit all, but I think you've really got to understand the tool set that you have currently in place within your environment. Uh, and I would suggest starting with the identity piece first. Thank you and. Vincent, a similar question, but with a mobility slant, what are some of the steps that you would take to implement Zero Trust for mobility? Yeah, so I, I just must say, I, I really do like the, the, the analogy that, uh, that we brought up earlier. Uh, and, and it really, in mobile, you, you'll find a lot of times, you know, honestly, uh, as attackers look for what's the best way to, to go after an enterprise, um, they're looking at the weakest link a lot. And you of agencies, right, and where they are with mobility. And I'll mention, you know, some folks, there's drive credentials or just mobile device management, also known as enterprise mobility management, or unified endpoint management, right, all the, the, the acronyms uh, there that you can bring. Uh, note that everybody is at different stages, and a lot of times they're very much immature. And a lot of times it comes down to we just don't have the resourcing and it's not prioritized over other other security capabilities that I need for my enterprise IT. So I think mobile is a great opportunity as for what steps you can take. So very clear, you know, cut and dry sort of deployment, right? Look at provisioning, right? Whether that's 
through some form of a device enrollment program and others to, to ensure that the security of the device build confidence, right? Configuration management and policy enforcement through an MDM. Look at um, you know application you know deny, uh, allow and deny listing, right? Application testing that you can do. Um, building in those workflows so that agencies and and user the user experience can have what they need. It, it's seamless to them and, and it all happens in the background. Other parts are things like mobile threat defense, right? More on the device and application behavioral. Uh, you know, uh, uh, security that you can look at the device. So you have technologies today, even on the identity side, where you can put things like, hey, well, what what equates to anomalous behavior? Geofencing, gate technology, how do I build higher trust? It, it'll, it'll be a journey to get there and not all technologies um, are, are, you know, equal or, or get us there fully, but there are some things you can do today with, you know, inherently, you know, app isolation, micro segmentation is already built in, right? Um, uh, you, the fact that you can do things like a uh, certificate pinning per app VPN for network, uh, full data encryption for the device, you can turn that on. There's a lot of things you can do to build, you know, whether defense in depth, but really higher confidence in the, the device and how you attach it to your network and access to any resource, the network, the data, you name it. So there is lots of steps that can be taken um, for, you know, the device the identity application network. And then eventually, I think the, the, the governance and, and visualization that you'll a lot of near term things you can do now with existing technologies. Yeah, thank you, Vincent. And Michael, you're our industry perspective on the panel. So what you got for us? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I guess my biggest uh, comment and my colleague put this in the chat as well is to just start somewhere. Uh, you know, we see a lot of people that are, you know, doing a lot of analysis about what zero trust is and what it means. and uh, you just need to get started. Uh, I think we talked a little bit and I heard a little bit of comments about things like doing a risk analysis and uh, your basic cyber hygiene, hardening and defining things, turning on data protection like encryption and other services and things of that nature. The other thing I'll note too is, you know, we've seen and, and we have, I know someone from CISA here on the panel. So, you know, CISA, OMB, putting out great guidance for agencies to follow in terms of you know, how to tackle this problem and what, what things to uh, look at and consider. And, you know, since, you know, the theme of this event is automation, you all know, note that, you know, automation is critical to getting to almost all of those initial steps and, and maturing your infrastructure in terms of uh, building out the zero trust capabilities, uh, you know, whether it's automating your mobile device management, uh, automating your micro segmentation of your networks or firewall control. Uh, and in fact, you know, we've seen already uh, certain parts of, our, you know, the, the security and, and IT industry, you know, targeting zero trust automation tools. Uh, like, for example, if we look at like zero trust network access, uh, it's a fairly mature market. There's existing tools are already out there to help automate the process of managing uh, your networks from a zero trust perspective and individualizing things like your host firewalls, your network device configurations and things of that nature that can help you remove your dependence on a VPN, for example, which as the CISA and OMB guidance points out is kind of a weak point in most infrastructures. It's not a zero trust kind of oriented concept because it concentrates all your traffic into a single place. And, and once an attacker can breach that VPN, they, they basically are on your internal network. So, you know, we can, we can employ those types of technologies to help automate those network controls. And that's a good way to get started early. And then I'll maybe, you know, pivot to a little bit on the idea of you know, going back to the theme of challenges is, you know, one of the big challenges is going to be just identifying everything in your enterprise that we need to apply zero trust concepts for. So inventorying things. And we talked, I heard someone talk about uh, doing, you know, doing this for our identities, understanding, you know, what all our systems are, what the data is, and, and what the policies and rules that we need to apply from a zero trust perspective. And most, uh, I think, agencies and organizations haven't looked at, at what that inventory is and, and crafted the zero trust policies they need to apply. And that's going to be, an, I think, another big challenge that, you know, we're going to need to apply automation to, to, to do that inventorying and analysis on, our, on those systems. Thanks, Michael. So we're going to take a quick pause right here to pull, put up poll question number two. Um, and as always, if there's additional comments from our panelists, please share those with us. Otherwise, I'll move on to my next question. Poll number two, though, in your opinion, how important is higher standards when it comes to zero trust development? Go ahead and answer that. 
Uh, Bill, I want to start this next one off with you, please. Uh, what activities while implementing a zero trust architecture will have the most immediate security impact, do you feel? Hmm. Well, I what activities? Uh, you know, the will have the most impact. I think some of the things we just discussed before, I discussed before, um, communications among the various stakeholders in our, our team and inculcating folks with the, you know, these ideas, then um, practically, I, I think our goal to actually enable an application um, without having to come into the network and then go back out again, uh, to be available and applying all the zero trust principles and controls and uh, all the requirements that OMD, OMB is mandating and, and actually having a successful run at that will be, you know, the activities that we're gonna be participating in in, in the coming year. Um, I, you know, I'd say that's, 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 that's it for the most part. I think it's also, you know, part of that is taking inventory, you know, alongside of targeting that one suite of applications um, is, uh, 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 you know, taking inventory of all that you have and then aligning your zero trust goals with the other strategic plans that you have around your operations, whether it's moving more assets to the cloud or, um, or replacing assets with some more modernized technologies and things like that. You're, you know, re-engineering your systems and, and so forth. And what would this um, zero trust architecture look like within the federal law enforcement agencies? If you could paint a picture for us. You know, the architecture uh, from, you know, down in the weeds is, is one thing uh, from the, at a higher level, it's, you know, it's accessing, you know, one of the things I thought of was that one of the pain points I have is, for example, that there are services in Azure government and Azure commercial that aren't available yet in Azure, Azure government. Um, and I'm sure that that's something that folks experience in some of the other cloud service providers. There are also applications and innovations out there that we can't, we can't take advantage of because uh, they are, you know, these you know, companies may be small or entrepreneurial or, and may have a good, um, uh, a, a, you know, a good um, motion going with the, the private sector, but can't participate in, uh, at government, uh, folks can't participate with them because they're not FedRAP, for example. And I think that um, if, if we can get to a point where those zero trust principles are standardized and that we can connect to these, let's just call, I mean, somebody came to me, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago with uh, monday.com. And I said, well, you know, we're going to have to use Microsoft Planner for now. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities out there that I think we, uh, for, for using some of these innovations, innovative technologies and services that are available, you know, uh, by applying these principles. So. Thanks, Bill. And we have an audience question, which I'll get to in just a moment. But do any of our panelists have additional comments they'd like to make? I, I can jump in on the architecture piece and, and I'll just keep it at the highest levels. But the reality is, is you're investing in cloud. You're investing in cloud resources and using those resources. Uh, you're looking at SD-WAN capabilities. You're looking at using the internet as your um, uh, communication platform and, and, and transport flat platform. Um, you've got policy enforcement points within your environment from an access perspective. So you're making access decisions. So these are the sort of things that you've got to consider. Uh, some agencies are going to be more in a hybrid model to start with. At ICE, we made our, our cloud journey five years ago. We're completely in, in the cloud at this point. Um, I embrace that. I'm happy. I think there's a lot of good security within the cloud. So that makes our journey from a zero trust perspective, I think, a little bit easier than, than the hybrid model. But I think there's there's pluses and, and, and negatives to, to both. All right. Thank you all. So, Vincent, it looks like this audience question is for you. And just as a reminder to our audience, we only have a few more minutes left. So if you have questions, send them in now or forever hold your peace. Uh, question for Vincent. You mentioned that platform vendors have micro segmentation built in. Could you please elaborate upon that? Are you referring to security groups offered via cloud service providers? Did you mean network segmentation, north-south security as opposed to east-west security? Uh, could you please expand upon that? Yeah, so it could be all the above, but actually uh, within the, the actual operating system, 
uh, it's actually built in, in, in for, for app isolation containerization already there, right? And so, and it's, it's progressed. If you've been checking for the last, I don't know, five plus years, um, you'll see the capabilities didn't just turn on over time, right? For example, uh, apps, you know, long, a uh, well, few years back or so, now I get to see how long, but uh, you could do things like uh, the, the in, in iOS as an example, right? Uh, mobile threat defense could actually, without having uh, the same rights and API access as, a, as an MDM or EMM, they could tell you all the apps that exist on the device. You can't do that today, right? Um, there are certain P APIs allowed or not allowed based on the type of of, of role you have within that if in, in what type of access you get, but that micro segmentation exists within the platform. Yes, the other parts of cloud security providers and others also uh, make that uh, a, another aspect, right? You can do things like, you know, one of one of the programs actually CISA has is a protective DNS, right? And protective DNS for mobile. And you can think of older technologies like uh, DNS sinkholing, right? And, and it's essentially what CISA is standing up today uh, for DNS, but how do we encompass that not on your traditional, you know, desktop and laptop server environments, but now how do I do it on mobile devices, right? Uh, is it is traditionally at the app layer, right? Uh, you don't have access lower layers in that. So um, being able, you know, it's a, it's a plus and a minus depending on how you see it and how the enterprise wants to enforce security. But honestly, having zero trust architecture built in all the way through or just with those concepts in mind is, is very helpful. Hey, hey Vince. It Curious if I may just jump in really quick. Um, you know, when I look at uh, attack vectors, you know, that go after the end user, uh, you know, uh, as well as the wide open operating system, you know, that's how they get a foothold sometimes. And, and that's one of my biggest concerns. I like what you said about the, the mobile devices. Um, but if I may ask a question, Vince, real quick here. Um, do you see that um, like with iPhones and Androids that we're gonna see more um, threats going forward that the adversaries are gonna be going after those mobile devices more? Yeah, I have to be careful of my answer, but uh, yes, uh, definitely. And you can probably yeah. your, your numbers that you have to report up on FISMA and all the other ones, and you yeah. can identify who's susceptible and who isn't, right? Um, go, go get that at your headquarters. But uh, what I would definitely say is that um, a lot of times today, attackers are seeing it as the weakest link. We are doing, we are doubling down on cloud security. We are doubling, you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, some of the, the hybrid and on-prem, you know, identity challenges we have are actually being deprecated from various vendors, not to name anybody, right? Um, and so a lot of those problems may be going away and people are looking at, well, what's the, what's the weaker link, right? What, where do you invest all your, your dollars as a CISO in your agency, right, uh, or department? Um, and, and think about how much do I spend on traditional IT enterprise and cloud even versus how much do I spend on mobile and, and security of that, right? You can go check the budgets and everything else. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an area that I honestly has been a weak link for a while. Um, and the fact is when people try to move to zero trust, they're looking at, oh, well, I can use my, my mobile device as a part of my MFA, right? That, that's the, one of the, the common ways. Um, but understanding that threat vector, understanding, you know, there's human interaction there. Uh, unlike a laptop, I take this not to belabor it, right? I don't keep my laptop. I mean, COVID, I guess I left it on and battery died or whatever. But the truth is I have a phone on me always, right? Um, I'm, I take that with me. It can record me. It can know where my location is. It's always on. Uh, a laptop, it's always connected, yeah. Yeah, it's, yep. it's a it's yep. totally yep. different attack surface. So, you know, yeah. Thanks. And, um, Rob, there's another question uh, for you is you mentioned identity first perspective approach. Could you elaborate on your approach and challenge? Um, are you using any automation in identity governance? Yeah, so so right now um, we're uh, actually our use case right now is a really interesting one. Um, we're looking at our our external authentication capabilities. So we've got non US citizens that we've got to track once they get in. Uh, to, to the country. So we're looking at ways uh, right now, our focus is on uh, authenticating and identifying those individuals, which is really a, a tough thing because when you look at identity proofing, they're, they're non-US citizens. So I don't have the ability to, to, to proof them in, in traditional ways. Um, so we're looking at some of the, the non-traditional ways that we might be able to proof them. So that's where we're starting right now. That's one of the use cases. And then we'll, we'll then move that internally within our organization. 
All right, fantastic. So we are almost out of time. Um, we can send the rest of the questions to our panelists via email so that you guys can receive a you know thoughtful response. We don't have to rush through it. But that being said, with just a minute left on the panel discussion, uh, 30 seconds or less from each of the panelists, I'd like to hear your parting words with us, anything you'd like to leave our audience with. Maybe we could start um, in the same order we went in before, which uh, was Michael. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I guess I'm going to tee off of a comment that was made a few moments ago about uh, micro segmentation. I think one of the things that we also have to keep in mind as we move forward uh, adopting zero trust is that it's a multi-domain approach. So micro segmentation, I think the question was around network segmentation, but it's also device. It's also about identities. All those same concepts around segmenting apply all to all these topics. And so, for example, you know, micro segmenting your operating system uh, is going to be an important part. But all these things are going to rely on two things. Uh, one, that fundamental hardening, right? Those segments are only going to be as good as the, the fundamental hardening of the security boundary that you've created uh, across all those dimensions. And then two, because we're going to be trying to eventually open up access through that security boundary, uh, it's going to be, you know, reasoning on those identities, reasoning on uh, uh, what what the, the context is around those interactions. And, and again, we're gonna need you know, automation to coordinate that reasoning to make sure that we can open up the boundary when we need to and then close it down when we don't. Great, thank you, Michael. And then Vincent next. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just put a plug uh, for the applying zero trust principles to enterprise mobility. That document is out for request for comment. You can find that online. Um, uh, additionally, it is due uh, to April 20th, right? So you can email the cyber liaison at cisa.dhs.gov and really appreciate both industry and government agencies, enterprises, you know, response to that, right? That's really probably one of the first documents to cover both zero trust and mobile, right? As a as sort of a uh, that space, right? Hoping we can start that journey. So appreciate it. Thanks, Vincent. And then Rob? Uh, yeah, I'll just be really quick. And um, by the way, that's a great mobile document. I, I've read through it when it was published on, on March 8th. CIS is doing some really good stuff in that, that area. Um, I would just tell folks um, to each his own when it comes to zero trust. Uh, everyone's going to have a slightly different plan going forward. Look internally within your organization. Where are you mature and where can you start to make movement? But the big thing right now is just to start moving and, and, and going towards uh, getting those zero trust uh, concepts within your within your agency or environment. Thanks, Rob and Bill. We started this summit with you, so we'll wrap it up with you. About that, I, I would just say, you know, keep you know keep presence of mind at all times uh, at every juncture of you know the business value of this. It's um, you know there there are various aspects of it. Uh, the fact that we're going to know more about uh, you know what's going on. The fact that we can automate. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, incident response and interventions, um, the fact that we can, uh, you know, have uh, access to more uh, opportunities to, uh, you know, application uh, services um, and uh, better manage risk. I mean, with data encrypted, with, um, uh, you know, uh, with trust uh, or what is it? Verify trust. Don't trust and verify. Is that what it is? Um, and, uh, and some of the other tenants, you know, there's, there's, I think that if you, you communicate that along the way, both the folks who you work with and the folks that you have to, you know, pitch to, to get money to do this, um, and keep that same story continuously, always talking about the business value, uh, and, you know, come up with your own stories. Certainly we all have different missions and everything, um, but weave that into the conversation at all times. Excellent, thank you. And I think I still owe our audience one third and final poll question. So if our events team wants to post that up and um, I will hand it back over to our MC of the event, Alyssa, but thank you all so much. It's been such a pleasure and I hope to speak with you all again soon. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Story of Zoom life, I guess. Um, thank you so much, Kirsten and panelists. That was an amazing panel. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have to, for today. Um, I did want to thank Red Hat and Kerasoft again for being amazing partners for us. And thank you again for our panelists and keynote. Um, before you go, I did just want to put up one last poll question. Um, if you did fill out all six polls today, um, ATARG will send you your CPE credit right to your email. So please feel free to um, fill out this poll. So you'll get it right to your email.
um, I'll leave that up. Um, but as we are um, finishing up, we did just want to thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you at our next event, which is this Thursday, April 7th. Um, it is titled Access Management in DevOps, How to Cater Them to Hybrid Work. Um, so we hope to see you there um, and have a great rest of your day.